Did Mitsubishi's compact crossover eclipse the competition? Huh? I'm Steph. <laughs> I'm Jay. And this is Modern Motoring. Today we're taking a spin in the 2024 Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross. <sighs> it came from <laughs> such a good car, which was the Eclipse, but I get it. The Corolla Cross, and now this, mm -hmm. and the old names are new, but where would you like to start? Well, I guess we can explain the Noir Edition, which is what we're driving. This is a Canada-specific trim. Here in Canada, Mitsubishi is adding a Noir Edition trim to everything in the lineup. And that's, you know, blackout trims are trendy. I know, Nissan has the midnight one, and there's black this and black mm. that. Right, so Mitsubishi's toss into that ring is this Noir Edition. So this is the first SUV in the Mitsubishi lineup here in Canada to get this treatment. Right. Second from the top trim, based on the SEL. So you get black wheels with lug nuts. 18 inch wheels, which is pretty okay. Yep. I'll get to more Sorry, on that later. Not black with lug nuts. Of course you get lug nuts. The but lug the, nuts the, the, are also black. <laughs> you get Eclipse Cross spelled out in black across the front. There's mm -hmm. a tiny little Noir badge on the bottom of the tailgate. Which you can hardly see because it's also black. <laughs> you got a black headliner, black accent pieces, black stitching. So it's just like everything else does not affect the performance at all. It is all strictly cosmetic. Right. I don't mind it. Mm -hmm. It's it's okay, but I will say I like this the most of all the competitors as far as design goes. Yeah, you're a big fan of the exterior styling. One thing I missed for the Noir package is it's the only one to get an over -soy soyzed. <laughs> Over, <laughs> that's not a word. Oversized spoiler. You want to try that again? Nope, okay. I do not. <laughs> I like it. It's got just enough angles. It's not as crazy as the Tucson. It's not as bland as the uh, RAV4. It's not as curvy as the Sportage. It's not as bland and boring as the Forester. Mm. It has just enough of everything to look extremely sharp. Nice long, thin headlights up front, and it's, you know, I like the way it looks overall. I'm going to make some people really happy by saying this and upset some people a lot. I get Cadillac vibes off it. What part? The whole, the overall design. Really? Yeah. All right, I, I can see that, mm. I'll give you that. The problem with the 18 inch wheels is there's a massive gap between the top of the wheel and the bottom of the wheel arch. Mm. It looks unfinished. It looks like they could have put 19s or 20s. They wouldn't because of the class of vehicle it is, but it just looks a little funny. Like they were trying to do a lift on it mm. that just didn't go very well. One thing I am a big fan of that Mitsubishi changed in the last redesign, the refresh of this vehicle a couple of years ago, when this first launched, I think six years ago or so, it launched with a split rear window, like Ooh. Prius style, old Prius style. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that at all. I find it really visually distracting, so. The Ionic had that nonsense too. It did, yeah. Like and it. I'm glad that everybody's going away from that because there's just no need for it. Coming to the inside, I think, it's pretty standard quality of materials and that sort of thing in here for this price range. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I find everything especially cohesive design-wise. It's a little bit pieces here and there and... I think your expectations have to be realigned. And not you, like my expectations mm. have to be realigned. I was expecting a bigger screen and more advanced technology but that's not what Mitsubishi is No. right now. I think they'll get there, but I don't mind the small low-res screen. I don't mind the low-res 360 cam that comes on some trims. I like the physical touch buttons. I have no problems with it. For a function-first vehicle, I think this does it quite well. It's interesting because this vehicle was the first to be released after the Alliance was announced. With Nissan. But it wasn't yet designed under the Alliance. It was still a Mitsubishi vehicle. Right. It just, the timing happened to be, so it's a few years old mm -hmm. and Mitsubishi didn't have all these parts in their bin at that time. So it makes sense that we have things like this screen that sort of looks placed on top. Mm -hmm. It'll get caught up very shortly once the designers can dip into the Nissan parts bin, which they've done a little bit here with the I heated saw. seat. Yeah, the, this is Nissan through and through these heated seats, which is, I, there's gonna be more of that when we get to the next version of this vehicle. But right now, it's a little bit cobbled together. It's just uh, the nature of when it came out. I think it's fine. I think 2026 will be the refresh. Mm -hmm. Also the no, redesign. Redesign, sorry. With the refresh happening in 2022. Mm -hmm. And there'll be some kind of hybrid powertrain with it. There has and, to be, if not yeah. a full EV. Um, and we know they have it because the Outlander has the plug-in style to yeah. it. 
everything else is pretty much the same. Big analog dials in the instrument cluster, a small little digital screen in the middle. Uh, there's a weird plastic insert in the bottom part of the steering wheel. I don't really like it. And I also don't like that the entire wheel is not heated. Mm. Tops and bottoms not, sides are yes. It's, it's fine. It's fine it is, is a really fine. good way to explain it's, it. It's good. You've got two USB ports, higher trim's got a USB port in the back. Um, physical dials on the infotainment, as well as some touchscreen stuff on the bottom and obviously the entire screen itself. There's nothing wrong with this. I will land on that. There is absolutely nothing wrong with it. Oh, yes, there is. The mirror controls are on the door handle. Yeah, it's, it, that really mm. bugs me, and it's sort of all gets in the way of trying to get down to the window controls down here. But aside from that, it's, it's, what's the thing you say all the time? It's inoffensive. Yes, that's a good one. Good for that. I've got one thing, mm. and this is this would prevent me from buying the car only oh, because of my okay. build. Most people wouldn't have this problem, but if you have a tall torso like me, it's going to bug you how high the seating position oh, is relative right. to everything else in, else in the car. I've got the headliner at the top of my sight oh, no. here, and there's not enough height adjustment on either of these seats. 663 liters with the rear seats up mm -hmm. and 1419 liters with them down. Not best in class. But no, it's that's on the smaller good. side. What's really interesting is the color of the tonneau cover. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit. It's like an abstract gray, white, black thing. And I don't and know, I like it. Nobody they, sees it, but. No, but I mean, when everything else in the car is black and it's even called noir <laughs> because everything's <laughs> supposed to be black, it <laughs> kind of comes across as a little out of place. Can't just call it artistic? Sure, let's go with all that. Right, all right. So back to the numbers here because you and I have been discussing this at length over the last few days mm. in terms of where does this fit in class. When I was on the launch for this, again, years and years ago, I remember talking to a colleague about how we were going to be comparing it with Subaru Crosstrek, maybe CX-5, which is a little on the bigger side, HRV, that kind of smaller <laughs> class. And we were told at the time, no, that's not the intention. This is meant to compete with CRV, RAV4. Everything in the compact. Be the world. compact. Because Mitsubishi has, I think it's Outlander Sport in the US, mm. RVR here in Canada, which is smaller even than this. And that is intended to be the subcompact. Like the way Nissan has the Rogue and Rogue Sport, the Rogue Sport is the cash pack. Right. But when you look at these cargo figures and you look at the interior space here, it's not all the way no. to a CRV and a, and a RAV4. Maybe a little closer to RAV4. But CX-5 I can see being a fair comparison on size here, but... The RVR is closer to the HRV. Mm -hmm. So this kind of sits in the middle and yeah. if you've been in the Outlander in this generation, it's pretty much build off the Rogue. Yeah, slightly extended in the back so they can really wedge that third row in, but that's a different discussion. We have a review of that as well if you're interested in looking at something a little bit bigger. I'll go with the Crosstrek, mm. only because it has standard all-wheel drive and it's the closest in size. Maybe a Forester though? Too big. Yeah. I put Forester and the Outlander together. Okay, so that's all this big. to say, if you're looking for a smaller compact SUV, you don't want quite as big of a footprint, but you want something that's a little bigger than a subcompact, this is where you should look. Okay, let's move on to the power and drive dynamics. So mm. under the hood, we have on every trim, a 1.5 liter four cylinder engine with 152 horsepower, 184 pound feet of torque running through a CVT and standard in Canada, super all wheel control, which is Mitsubishi's upgraded all wheel drive system. Where do you want to start? Fuel figures. Oh, and interestingly, okay. they are all the same for all trims. Mm -hmm. And not all trims are the same because the higher trims get a sunroof, which add a lot of weight. And wheel sizes and that sort of thing, but yeah. So I'm a little surprised that both Mitsubishi Canada and Natural Resources Canada has one set of fuel figures. Mm -hmm. So that's a little peculiar, and those fuel figures are exceptionally high. They are pretty high, more than pretty high. They are quite high for the class. 9.6 liters per 100 kilometers in city driving, 8.9 on the highway, and 9.3 combined. However, I will say part of what contributes to that higher fuel figure number is the super all-wheel control. Oh, and sure. this is a really good all-wheel drive system. So mm -hmm. there's all-wheel control and super all-wheel control. Super all-wheel control is standard on the Eclipse Cross and the two Outlanders. 
Right. And what's better about this system is it's full-time all-wheel drive, which increases your fuel use right there. Mm -hmm. But then both axles have torque vectoring. Different automakers tout different all-wheel drive systems. This one actually is a really good, like, rally roots quality all-wheel drive system. If you live somewhere where you get a lot of snow or you get you live around dirt roads and you really need good traction at all times, that's a plus for this vehicle because yeah. that's a system worth paying extra for. Standard safety is a little disappointing. Everybody gets forward collision mitigation. You go up to the SE or the SEL, and then you get blind spot monitoring and... Rear cross traffic alert. And then you jump up to the Noir or GT and you get everything before plus adaptive cruise and... Lane departure warning, which is also on SEL. Still. Yeah. I know it's a terrible comparison, but if I'm getting like a base model Corolla, mm -hmm. it gives me everything. Everything, yeah. yeah. Mitsubishi will get there. Coming back to power now, we gave you those figures a couple minutes ago. I find it just adequate. I think it is exceptional given the numbers on paper. Okay. No problems passing, no problems getting up to highway speed. It gets a little loud. Mm. It gets a lot of loud. But I know you don't need more than this. I don't know if I agree with that. I would really? like to have a little bit more. Yeah. More I, horsepower, more torque. More put the pedal down and it goes. That's torque. Um, I don't know. It's almost 200 pound feet. It for doesn't feel. In, in, is that, maybe it's the CVT. I never like a CVT. Yeah. But they had to put a CVT in this because if they... Geared it. Yeah, they they need every fuel saving they can get to make up for this all-wheel drive system that we discussed and, and the weight and everything else. Still so. hasn't really done all that kind of yeah. job. But, yeah, whatever, that's fine. It is a little loud mm. on the highway, you were noticing, and... Yeah, it's actually quite loud on windy days. You get a lot of noise transfer into the cabin. I also find the suspension's a little rough. Mm. It's a bit yeah. bouncy, a little bit crashy. I find it to be a function for his vehicle. Mm -hmm. Last thing, and it's not really driving related, but there's nowhere else to put it, so it's going to be put here. <laughs> it's a dual panel sunroof, and both have power sunshades, mm. which is something I don't think I've seen outside of the luxury world. Usually it's a manual sunshade in the rear and the power on the front, but front one tilts and slides and the back one doesn't do anything but i think it's kind of nice mm. to have that uh, little bit of advanced business here okay we're going to give you the pricing and then we're going to talk through the value proposition here mm. this is canadian pricing not including fees because mitsubishi canada doesn't really set their website up to make it easy to find you can do it you got to go through and go through the builder and yeah stuff. tick and untick a few boxes five trims and here they are yes from the es you start at twenty eight thousand eight ninety eight. so with fees just a take over 30. and then you go to the se which is just yes reversed <laughs> it's a little weird a little confusing uh, that is 32498 and right in the middle is the sel and that comes in at 35298 if you want this what we have here and what you've seen in the cutaways and the bureau 37598 and if you want the very top, mm -hmm. which is the GT, yep. we are at just under 40 at 38098. So, so just over 40 by the time you work in the fees and everything. Yeah, there's about a $10,000 gap between the ES and the GT. So out of these five here, mm -hmm. which one trim gets you the highest value? I would say the Noir. Really? Yeah. Mm. Maybe the GT, but by the time you're spending actually anything toward the top of this lineup, there's so much competition. It's I really know. hard to parse it all out. So. Here's my attempt. Mm. In the US, I think it's hard to make a case for the Eclipse Cross in general. The reason being, yes, Mitsubishi offers a 10 year, 100,000 mile. <laughs> Can you imagine if they give you 100,000 <laughs> mile powertrain warranty. Right. And two years of maintenance, and, and, and. Problem is, in the US, Hyundai and Kia offer the same thing and a little bit more. And I think what you get for the money there is just a whole lot better. You can't knock Mitsubishi on the dependability side. It does very mm -hmm. well in surveys, uh, mm -hmm. just as well as Hyundai and Kia. But? In the U.S. specifically, because Hyundai and Kia offer the equivalent or in some ways better, it's hard to make a case for this when you're look, putting it next to something like a Tucson or a Sportage. Now, on the other hand, when you're talking in Canada, Mitsubishi offers a 10-year powertrain warranty and nobody else does. 
So mm-hmm. if you're in Canada looking for a car that is dependable, functional, no bells and whistles, and there are lots of people who don't want all that mm-hmm. in their car. They just want to be able to get in it and go and not fuss around. They don't want a rolling computer. Right. They just want a car. And this is a good one in the sense that that super all-wheel control system it's is standard. standard and very good. Mm-hmm. And if the power is good enough for you, you can own this for 10 years, never worry about something going wrong with the engine because Mitsubishi mm-hmm. is going to fix it up for you. Nobody else offers that in Canada. As long as the thing isn't your fault. Right. When we were talking with our Mitsubishi rep, the thing that they were pushing is they want to be seen as a passion brand. Mm. I see them as a very purpose-driven brand mm-hmm. for people that, like you said, don't want a rolling computer. They just want something that is an SUV or a crossover and has some space and drives well. Mm-hmm. Very few people in the modern Mitsubishi world buy for passion. If this was an Evo, this was an Eclipse, this was that 3000 yeah. GT, uh, this was the Eclipse Spider, right? The same way people buy Supras for passion and BMWs for passion and other specific models of cars. I think Mitsubishi wants to get there. I don't know if they will get there. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope they do, because it's a great little car. But I think they need to recall their rally past somehow oh, and transfer it into the SUV world. I don't know how you do that and convince people, like, but Subaru is terrific for yeah, that. Yeah, it's true. Right? Like I know the WRX is not an SUV. Mm-hmm. I know they killed the STI. I know they're coming out with an AV version, but Mitsubishi, like you said, has a bunch of heritage and history that they should tap into. Mm-hmm. But for now, it's purposeful for passion. Thanks so much for watching. And if you haven't already, please hit that little button down there that lets you subscribe. Maybe hit that bell too so you don't miss any more of our videos because we'd love for you to see them and watch them and let us know what you think. You can also find us on all the major social media platforms. So please seek us out and thanks for watching.